it's a mission. I don't know why podcast editing now is my mission before the financial coaching was. And it forced me to get out of my shell and go out and do stuff because I knew I was helping people. And I wasn't put on the surface just to consume and, and, you know, sit in the sunshine and bask in the rays. Nobody helps people when you're sitting in the corner. Hello and welcome back to the Record Edit Podcast podcast. I'm your host, Bradley Denham, and today we're talking to a fellow podcast producer. His name is Steve Stewart. He's absolutely dominating the production of shows in the personal finance space. He's the creator of the Podcast Editors Club on Facebook, with currently over 4,400 members, and is now working on the Podcast Editors Conference. Steve, you're a busy guy. How are you doing? <laughs> you don't know how busy I am. I was actually <laughs> about to cancel this, but I knew it was important. And you're the first interview, first actual recorded interview since announcing the uh, the first ever podcast editor conference. Super excited to to see how that pans out. But uh, Me too. before we <laughs> before we really dive into that in the Facebook group, and of course making money doing podcast editing, let's first talk about your podcasting journey and and what led you to become a, a producer? Well, I've told this story a few times before, but it gets better every single time. <laughs> so I hope not to bore everybody with my story. Uh, I started getting into personal finance, just learning about it back in the early 2000s. Bumped into Dave Ramsey on the radio, started listening and following his stuff. We actually, my wife and I got out of consumer debt 2007. And I knew this is something that most people weren't being taught. They definitely weren't being shown or taught this in schools. It was stuff that nobody really you know, saw it on their own until they were in crisis mode. So I thought, okay, I'm going to start a, a small financial coaching business. So here in St. Louis, started that up. And then 2010, I was listening to podcasts, love podcasts. So I thought, you know, I've got the gear. I know what, you know, I know how to record on Audacity. I can do a podcast because everybody can do a podcast, right? Launched the thing in 2010. And then there's a conference that started called the Financial Blogger Conference, started in 2011. I missed the first one, but I went to the 2012 and loved the community. There's these people writing about financial topics, mostly bloggers, but then there were podcasters like me. There were people starting to do YouTube videos and stuff like that. And I was always encouraging people to put their face and their voice on their blog. So I was the blogger who had a podcast. After a few years just being known as the guy who knew more about podcasting than the rest of them, which wasn't a lot, but, but of course, you know, if you know a little bit more than everybody else, you're considered the expert. I had a couple of famous bloggers come up to say, Steve, they, they just wanted to hit record and they asked me to do the rest. And I had spare time. I was like, yeah, I know, I know what I'm doing. I'd love to help you out. Sure enough, we launched the show and it's really big known bloggers. They had big email lists. So it became very popular. And then when this community, this FinCon community heard you could outsource the pain of editing I got more people calling and more people calling. So between January 2016 to July 2016, it just grew so many clients from my peers, my friends, that I had to give everything else up. Everything I was doing, I had to give up. I retired my podcast. I stopped financial coaching. I just started because I had no time to do anything else except for podcast editing. And then it just exploded from there. What do you say to the guy that's, that's still struggling to find their first client? How did you find your first client? Being part of that community is how. Uh, and I was just talking about this with the, we had a webinar last night announcing the uh, the conference. And one of the questions was, you know, where do you, where's this water hole where you can find the clients just hanging around? There's right. no such thing, except when you are involved in a community. And I'm not talking about go to podcast conferences. Yes, go to the podcast conferences to learn about the, the skills, the art of podcasting. But if you're already belonging to a community of something that interests you, well, you would be the guy who would help that community. I'll give you a story. Inside of the FinCon community, even before I, I became the podcast guy, I guess you'd say, there was a guy, his name is Grayson Bell. He had a financial blog, but then he started, he had a really uh, a good talent for solving problems with people's websites, WordPress problems, email marketing, stuff like that. Anytime somebody in the FinCon Facebook community had a question, he'd hop in there and he'd answer the question to where people started calling him and hiring him to do little jobs. And then it just got to grow into this big thing. And everybody knew Grayson was the guy to call if you had a problem. Well, then I became known as the Grayson Bell of podcasting is what they call me. So 
I became known as the podcasting guy. And then there's a guy in the group now who's known for the YouTube. And there's some people in there who are also known for these skills. And it's not just like one person owns it all. But we were involved in the community before we became specialists in something that would help them. So if you're involved in meetup groups, if you're involved in you know social groups, be the person who helps out, be the person who answers those questions and people will naturally gravitate towards you. On that note too, I noticed on your website, you call yourself the podcast editor for personal finance shows. And kind of in the same vein, would you recommend that other freelance producers try to niche down and like zone in on being the guy for that interest? Absolutely. I absolutely do. Now, we don't know what that means. I mean, it, you can define mine because I went to this conference and everybody at it for pretty much goes to this conference, but it doesn't have to be something like that. Now, I won't say that you have to just only take clients like that when you're getting started. I will say, though, that th that should become your eventual goal, because right now I am at a point where I have so many clients, I can be very, very picky. Uh, in fact, I should be. I, I should start saying no to some people. <laughs> And and I, I I should. But because I have, you know, a full plate, I don't need any more business to take on unless I want to grow this thing past myself and I'm working on that. But when I first started out, I was taking, you know, I had a chiropractic doctor, I had a guy who was selling real estate, I had a guy who was um a different type of doctor. They were my clients because they heard about me from somebody else and it just grew from there. So that of course helped me build a portfolio. Uh, more recommendations, more testimonies. And when the plate got full and I was able to raise my rates, then they naturally kind of progressed away because I also helped them find another editor. That's that's something we can talk about maybe later. I've also seen you say frequently in posts and videos that I've seen in the group and even on a t-shirt that podcast editing is my job, not yours. <laughs> And of course, we know what that means, but what exactly does that mean when you say that to the host you're trying to work with? Well, that's the perfect phrase to let people know that they shouldn't be doing their own editing. If they hate it, it's not their job. Think about it. If you're an editor for yourself, you're not getting paid to do that. Yes, you get the benefit of having a podcast and forever, whatever the residual uh, benefits are that, that people listen, and maybe you've got a Patreon or something like that, but it's probably not your job. So podcast editing isn't your job if it's your own show. It should be somebody else who's doing that for you. Take that weight that, I mean, that's a lot of time to edit your show. If you're doing the deep dive type editing I'm talking about doing, not just putting the tails on and, and mixing it down to MP3. So the podcast editing is really not something that you should be doing yourself if you're trying to grow this, this podcast into something bigger than just 30 minutes or 60 minutes a week on iTunes. And it is such a huge time suck. I remember when I first got started, it was taking me like 10 hours to edit a show. And I like came from a music background doing audio. And it's just a different animal. And a lot of these people are just business people or, or personalities. Or, and they have no media production experience. So they shouldn't even, like you said, they shouldn't be editing their show. Like that's yeah. not their job. Their job is to create the content, not get lost in the production of it. Exactly. If you're a heart surgeon, you should not be replacing your garage door. That is not something you should be doing. You should be paying somebody else to do that. Now you could, and I'm not saying that you wouldn't enjoy it too, because a lot of people like to do things around their house and repair things. But you know, when it comes to electricity and plumbing, uh, 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 -uh. <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to hire a specialist because a, I could electrocute myself. That's not very good. And B, they're going to do a better job more efficiently. And yes, it might cost me a little bit more money, but I get my time back. That's a lot more valuable to me uh, you know, as a heart surgeon or as a podcast editor, my time is more valuable to me than the 200 bucks to have them, you know, fix the wiring in a faulty uh, ceiling fan or whatever. Well, let's go a little bit deeper on, on the value of a podcast editor. Before we get into rates and the money and what everybody wants to hear, let's first talk about the practical. What exactly makes a podcast editor great? Customer service. And of course, delivering a good product. I'll tell you, I'm not the best editor in the world, but for some reason, this community sees me as the expert. Uh, now, I do a decent job, and we are talking about podcast editing. We're not talking about a multi-million dollar movie production where, you know, if if, if you see, we, we were watch, my wife and I were watching an old movie the other night. Uh, it was still in color, so it wasn't too old, but it was an old movie, and we saw the boom arm come into the shot. You know, the, the microphone was in the shot, and we pointed it out because it's kind of funny. You know, that stuff just... 
you 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 can't really get away with that in you know big production films or audio dramas or theater uh, podcasting. Yes, you should have a really good show, but it doesn't have to be perfect, is what I'm saying. Now, perfection is objective; it's an objective term, so everybody can perceive that the way they want. But there's a little more leeway because a lot of people you're listening to this wonderful audio production in dinky little earbuds. <laughs> so an audio editor is really more about the service that you're providing, be able to improve the product so that there's less friction for the listener. That's the way I describe it to my clients is you're paying me a lot of money, but what I'm doing is I'm removing the friction for your listener. All these stumbles or, you know, the guest keeps starting everything with, oh, that's a great question. That just gets to be repetitive and mostly annoying after a while. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Everybody listening knows what I'm talking about. So let's get rid of the friction when we can and make it so we can get to the meat of the content right away because that's what the listeners are for. And they will value this show more than the show that doesn't take the time to take those things out. So my clients are also becoming more competitive in the podcasting space because their product is better. And it's because they're not spending half their time editing. They've got that. Plus, they might have somebody who's doing their show notes or they're doing their social media. You know, that way they can, the, my host, my, my client can focus on at least getting the next interview set up and recorded <laughs> and not editing the show. I also think it just shows a respect for the listener's time because all those ums and ahs and repeats and, and just pointless pieces of content, that all adds up. I think you were actually the one that that turned me on to thinking this way. And that's that if you have a one hour interview and you cut out, for example, 10 minutes of garbage, whether that's ums, ahs, whatever, and multiply that by X amount of downloads that episode gets, you're saving like hundreds of thousands of minutes potentially. Yeah, That's a lot of time when you think about it like that. Yeah, so, it's funny. Inside of the Facebook group, we occasionally talk about how much time we cut out of these interviews and it always hovers between 12 to 18 percent and if you think about an hour-long recording is now instead of 60 minutes it's now 48 minutes hmm. yeah think of it 12 minutes saved 100 listeners that's a lot of time that you just saved and it, it you know it's, it's a nice way to look at it it's, of course i like doing some math and stuff but <laughs> really it's that friction that you've taken away. You've gotten rid of the crap right. too. Cause you're not, not only are you getting to your destination faster by listening to less audio, but it's fewer road roadblocks and, and bumps in the road getting there. And it's a lot more pleasurable, pleasurable experience. So what do we, what do we say to the guy that takes your advice and focuses on their niche and their community and picks up their first client? And now they're sitting there with the like their DAW open working on the show, but they still haven't quite figured out what they're charging for their work. Where do you think is a good starting point? Well, I say you have to make at least $20 an hour. And that's even before you dig into income taxes and all that garbage. I mean, you've got to make at least 20 bucks an hour. So if you're spending three hours on a project, you know, you better be making 60 bucks or more. Now, we have found that the average that's charged for a 60-minute recording, and that could be the entire show, too. It doesn't just mean it's a straight-up interview, but you're taking the 60-minute recording, you're doing the detailed editing, the ums and the ahs, the, the, you know, people haven't heard the edits that you've made at the point you're listening now because right. you're going to cut these out. I had to go tell my dog to stop, you know, messing around. <laughs> they don't know that until I just said it. Right. <laughs> you take out all the junk. You do the noise reduction, you do the noise, uh, the volume leveling, mix it down to MP3, give them the whole package back. That was about 100 to $110 for 60 minute. Now, it might take them three hours to do that. And at that point, they're making about 33 bucks an hour on average. So they're, they're beating that. You've got to kind of go backwards in your calculation to figure out, am I charging enough? And that's just the starting point. Now, we did also find in the survey that the average rate charged for all the people that, that responded was about 40 bucks an hour. Now that's hour worked. So that would be a nice benchmark to try and hit. If you're working three hours on a project, start to finish, then 120 bucks is what you should be charging because that'd be 40 bucks an hour. And that's just going to make you average. For context, I know exactly what you're talking about when you mentioned the survey because like I'm part of the group. But for those who aren't 
yet, which they should be, because I really believe that the the podcast editors club is like by far the most helpful place for Thank anyone you. wanting to do podcast production. But for a little context, let let's dive into the survey. What were some of the questions and who were the survey takers? I'm assuming it was the group. I'm bringing it up now. Cool. This is another edit point. <laughs> <laughs> I almost want to leave these in just for the irony. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so bad. All right. So the questions were, uh, and I gave you the parameters earlier, 60 minutes, noise reduction, detailed editing, mix it down to MP3, give it back to them. How much would you charge? Again, the average, or maybe I didn't say this earlier, the average is between $100 and $110. Uh, on average, how long would it take? And the average time was somewhere around two and a half hours there. Um, now, if people want to get the slides and the details from uh, these, they can go and get them. We have a download link at podcasteditorsconference.com, and they can click on get that now and, and, and get the slides and everything. So they can get the actual details, you know, the whole dot matrix thing that mark put together pretty mark deal from pod atlanta he's just fantastic he's put all this stuff together the other questions were uh asking about other services that they provide so is it just editing you do or do you also provide show notes or social media management or voiceovers i was surprised at how many people offered voiceovers hmm. how much of your total income comes from podcast production and those services that i just mentioned and then I asked did they work full time which i consider 35 hours or more a week on podcast production services. And then what are some of the pod centric related events, kind of like meetups and conferences that you go to? And about a third of the people said they don't do any, but then we had quite a few said podcast movement. A good number said she, uh, she podcasts live, which is the first time coming up hasn't even happened yet. So we've got people who are interested in the big conferences and the small as well. How did you found the Facebook group and what led uh, like what led us here to now having a conference backing this Facebook group? And I yeah. think it's only a couple years old, isn't it? Yeah, it was January 2017. I, I love some of the other Facebook groups that have to do with podcasting, but I'm so tired of being in there. And of course, the first question is, oh, I'm new. Should I record <laughs> on Zencast or Squadcast? And this is, by the way, being recorded on Squadcast, which is really excellent. And you get those same questions every day. It's like, I, I, you know, I'm tired of those newbie questions. I really want to learn more about the production side. Right. All right, let's start a group just for the production side of podcasting. So I thought, okay, podcast editors. I'm an editor. I call myself an editor. Even though you might say production, it's a more generalized term. We'll just say editors. Be niche, right? Inch wide, mile deep. Let's go niche, podcast editors. And so I selfishly, you know, created this group because I want to hang out with my friends who did post-production. And like you said earlier, we're, we're almost at 4,500 members now. It's grown tremendously. And I am a real jerk. <laughs> and I will remove any post that goes, hey, uh, I just bought this mixer and nope, delete. Yeah. Because that's all content right. creation. There's no mixers in podcast editing. Right. It's all in the content creation. So we only talk about the post-production aspects. We don't talk about mixers. We don't talk about microphones. We certainly don't talk about you know media hosts unless we're trying to solve a problem for our clients. So that's why I started it selfishly because that's all I wanted to talk about because that's what I'm focusing on here at my business. And I think it's, it's, it's definitely, we've established those boundaries in that group now where we have those discussions and they can go deep or discuss wide and it's just fantastic. But how did that lead to the conference? I think that's coming up, uh, what, spring? You're in spring? Yeah. The conference really was uh, Mark Deal, my friend, my partner. He kept pushing me. In fact, there's another project that it's on my plate that he's been pushing me to do, and I really should do that. I just, I haven't, I haven't booked the time away to do it. But he was talking to me about, you should do a conference, and, and we could have it in Atlanta because it's a really big place. And he lives in Atlanta, so it makes it you know easy for him to go scope out places. And I'm like, gosh, you know, that would be kind of difficult. I don't know anything about conferences. Well, he was having conversations with some other people who run conferences, and one of them is Chris Kremitzos from PodFest, who's been running PodFest in Orlando for, for a number of years. But I've been to PodFest. It's fantastic. What we've ended up doing is that very first like pre-day, which is March 6th, Friday, March 6th, it's going to be a one-day event focused only on podcast production. So it is a silo conference. This is actually an idea that, that FinCon does. 
there's always a like a side conference that happens right before or after FinCon. This year, there were two that it followed immediately after. One's called CardCon, which is all about credit cards. Another one called Military Influencers, which isn't necessarily financial, but there's a lot of people who go to FinCon who have a military background who talk about money to the military or you know how it affects the military. So they're already there. It makes sense. You've already booked the flight. You've already got the hotel. Stay an extra day. And that's how this is going to work out perfect for PodFest. Because then if we end up you know, selling more than 100 tickets, we might need a bigger room. Well, we've already got the hotel. We already know where it's going to be. We can have it move to a slightly larger room to accommodate that. So that's what Mark has been working on to get that all set up. What are you most excited for? Oh my gosh, we get to hang out with podcast editors all day. <laughs> and I'm going to learn. I mean, there's going to be some really great sessions. I already talked to a few people who I've I've gotten ideas of what they're good at. And this is going to be the business side of, we, we might have a session or two about the actual production side of editing, but I really want to talk about the business side of it. So we're going to talk about marketing. We're going to talk about branding. We're talking about getting your clients, about getting, a, you know, getting your rates up, things like that. Uh, we haven't put anything in stone yet, but that's, you know, we just announced it last night. Give me some time. <laughs> I'm super excited. Um, on that note, let's dive into a little more of the business angle here and uh, talk about marketing and branding and raising your rates. A lot of people get hung up on raising their rates. I feel like we've all fell victim to that. So kind of keeping along with our example, with the guy that has niched down, got their first client, maybe they're working for $10 an hour. How, how do they make the jump to 20 and should yeah. they even be charging hourly or should they be charging by the project? Personally, I like to charge by the project because it it works as like a motivator to push me to become a more efficient producer. Right. Well, let's answer that first. You know, Do you charge for your time worked or do you charge for the editing that you do for them as far as a project? I'm like you, I like the project, but I do see cases where it makes sense for you to charge by the hour. The, the problem I have with charging by the hour is my client doesn't know what they're going to end up paying until I'm done. And there is the opportunity for people to fudge the numbers there. You know, they whip through it in an hour and say, oh, you know, they're drinking their coffee. So, yeah, it took three hours, man. My back hurts. <laughs> you know, and I, I don't ever want to be accused of that. So I just right. do it by the project. But there are tools out there that will help you to track your time and be able to prove it to your client to say, look, I'm charging you, you know, I don't know. We'll, we'll go with the $40 an hour thing. I'm charging you 40 bucks an hour at three hours, so there's 120 bucks. I do like the 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 project model though, and I charge my clients. Well, I have I have two models. I have a per month service, so I just play a fat a flat rate every month, and we already know how many episodes are going to release and what the length is going to be. They're they're pretty steady with that. But then there's clients who just are like, oh, I don't know if I'm always going to release an episode. Uh, I might want to do an extra one one month. Um, one might be short, one might be long. So I have a flat rate for 45 minutes of audio that they upload for that episode. And then, you know, if it goes longer, it's an extra 10 bucks for every 10 minutes or something like that. That way they know before they even upload how much it's going to cost them. So your first question was, uh, asking for a raise. Was that where we're going? Yeah. Getting the rates up. Well, supply and demand definitely has a big factor on that. When you're just starting out, and the way I started out, it was a side hustle. It was just a hobby. It wasn't even really something I thought could ever become a career. I mean, it's still crazy to me that it's been three and a half years and people pay me to do this. I mean, this is crazy. So I charged these people way, way. I mean, I might have been making, If I'd be lucky if I made 10 bucks an hour. Let me go back. First clients were two famous financial bloggers, Paula Pant and Jay Money. J Money from Budgets for Sexy, who, by the way, just sold his website to The Motley Fool. And if anybody knows who The Motley Fool is, that's a big deal. Okay. Wow. So they wanted to start the show together. They didn't want to do the editing because they're busy doing their blogs. They're successful bloggers and they had email lists and all this other stuff. They sent me these recordings. They're a good hour, hour and a half long. And I charge them 40 bucks an episode. Wah, wah, wah. <laughs> they're right there. <laughs> way undercharging. It was a side hustle. I was doing it in my spare time. Uh, wasn't really taking away from family time too much. There was, of course, some, but uh, you know that was just something that I wanted to to do for them, and I had to charge them something, and they also respect that. I mean, they weren't going to get it for free. So uh, once it got to be where, you know, I was getting more clients and stuff, the new clients that were coming bo- on board, I was able to charge more because I'd already established my credibility. They already knew, you know, my my portfolio, which might have just been the one show. And that might be all you need to get your second client say, oh, well, I edit, you know, Joe and Nancy's show. 
you know, and somebody's inquiring about you. So then you just raise your rate on the next one. In fact, I just found out how Brittany Felix from Podcasting for Coaches raises her rates. Every time she gets a new client, her rates go up for the next client. Maybe not much. Maybe it's only five bucks or 10. I don't know what it is. She says, every single time I get a client, my rates go up for the next one. That way you've got clients who might be on an old business model. And if they eventually drop off, your newest clients are, are paying. It could be up to double that easy to the point where now I'm not charging 40 bucks for anything. Uh, well, take that back. I've got a, a podcast and <laughs> their shows are under 10 minutes. So <laughs> I think I'm charging just as a starter package type thing, 40 bucks, but because I, I, I don't have anything like that. But they're they're definitely more than forty bucks, and and uh, that's that's how I, I like those ideas. And you know, raising your rates along the way as you get a new client, raise your rates for the next one. And if somebody comes back and says, "Oh, well, you were doing Tommy's show for this amount," okay, well, that was that amount back then. Yeah, uh, and don't feel don't feel bad about saying that. Uh, in this day and age, that is almost to be expected. I think that is the hardest part is like the psychological aspect of it. Especially when and when a situation like that occurs where someone just like references that, oh, you do this show for this much. Why aren't you willing to do mine for this much? But yeah, like with your finance guy, you know all about inflation and bills and all that. But is there ever a moment where it's too much? Like, where is the ceiling? Like, that's all fine and dandy to say, keep raising your rates. But when when does it eventually cap out? Cap out as in raising your rates? Yeah, let's say when we're people just... stop hiring you. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll tell you, it's going to be hard to find that because there are, I know people who are, who charge more than I do. By the way, they do a better job than me, so they should. But they also offer different services. But then you can go and say, well, we also offer, you know, we do an audiogram in the package or, you know, they do package deals. So first of all, the podcast industry is growing. Second of all, the people who are do-it-yourselfers aren't your clients, but they're not the only people getting into podcasting. There are a lot of people getting into it because it's a brand builder. It's a marketing arm of the business. They are now seeing that more than ever, the value of podcasting. Even though the ROI is not there, the return on investment is not there, especially in the beginning year, uh, beginning months, but having that extra way to create content that then can also become a blog post on your website, which gives you the Google juice and shows that you're an expert in your field, they're going to pay for that because it's it's gen it's making them a bigger expert in the eyes of their audience or their the people who visit their website or their business site. You mentioned how podcasting is a good marketing arm for business people, but how do we market ourselves as podcast producers to get that business? Mm. I say we have to go back to that community and that niche and going to local events and conferences. There's a lot of bad juju around, you know, the word networking, but it really truly is. For me, it's been the thing. It is the thing. So it's getting out there and talking to people. And there's a lot of introverts in the podcast editing business. I get that. There are ways to be hired to edit for other people. So you don't have to work for a podcaster or you could work for a company who then gets the clients. And, and I mean, just, just think about uh, Daryl Darnell from Pro Podcast Solutions who has over 130 active clients. He's not edit every, editing everything. He's got a team of editors. And they may not deal with the client at all because they have a project manager that handles you know, a group of, of shows and can be that median person between the host and the editor and the show notes writer and whatever else they do. So you don't necessarily have to go out and get your own clients. It's just, I think it might be a little more difficult to prove you're of any worth to a company like that. Unless of course you have those conversations. If you happen to talk to Daryl Darnell and say, Hey, I'm pretty good. Uh, let me prove it to you. And you can actually prove it to him somehow. Maybe you've got your foot in the door to get hired as an editor just to edit and not to market yourself, not to deal with customers and clients and all that stuff. Would you consider yourself an introvert? I used to. You used to. That's interesting. I used to. Yeah. What changed? Yeah. All right. So we're going to get into faith-based talk here. 
Let's Everybody go. get ready. <laughs> I'm putting my God head on here, okay? It's a mission. I don't know why. Podcast editing now is my mission before the podcast or the uh, financial coaching was. And it forced me to get out of my shell and go out and do stuff because I knew I was helping people. And I wasn't put on this earth just to consume and, and you know, sit in the sunshine and bask in the rays. We can do that too, but I was here to serve people. So he put me on this earth to serve people. I got to get out there and do stuff and help people. And, and that's why you'll always see that I'm giving. I get, I've, I've been so blessed in my life. There's, I, I want for nothing. Uh, it's because he's blessed me. It's because I'm giving. I'm always giving to people and I'm not doing it to get. So I've always been a giver. And that's that's kind of how I think uh, people like to be around givers. And there's another marketing tool. Always give. Yeah. <laughs> give your time, your talents, your service. Yeah, be a helpful giver. So that's kind of how I got out of my introvert shell is because it, it forced me to get out of it. I had to. Nobody helps people when you're sitting in the corner. Interesting. I feel similarly because... A small part of why I wanted to start a podcast was to kind of get over that fear of putting myself out there and talking to people because uh, for for the longest time, like you were you were saying that if you didn't want to directly interface with clients, like perhaps try joining a company. And that's kind of how my story has played out in that it just became a chore reaching out to people, like person after person trying to work with them. And it kind of had a a small psychological effect on me. And it's just like, uh, like dealing with rejection. Like, I I guess back then I didn't really know how to deal with that in a healthy manner. And I really think podcasting has been the thing to, to help not only like as a listener or an editor or now a podcaster is just all around. This industry is very, I think it's a very beautiful industry because there is so much opportunity to help people and you never know the impact that just having a conversation can have on people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. People can relate by listening to your podcast for free on their smartphone, which is always in their pocket. It's amazing. They just have to find the show. You just have to relate to them as a host for some editor. So I never get to deal with that, but (laughs) You say you start a podcast. There's better. You said you start a podcast to get out of your shell. I think there's better ways than putting yourself through going, you know, creating a podcast, which is (laughs) can be painful. You know, just take an improv class for a couple of months and you'll solve that problem. But (laughs) starting a podcast is kind of like you're beating yourself up over and over again every single week trying to get an episode (laughs) out. (laughs) It's worth it, though. It it really is. Yeah, I think there's a lot more benefits than just not being an introvert anymore. And there's, you know, speaking opportunities. One of the things that also was a benefit from, and this is actually before I became a podcast editor, uh, because I was always talking about the medium of podcasting and how that can help a person grow their business by having a podcast. I got to speak at local meetups like the small business group, the self-employed group. And that just, again, it, it helped me to not just get out there out of my shell, but it helped me to spread the message of podcasting, which I believed in. It also made me, in the eyes of these people, the expert. Not that anybody hired me, but it also helped me to be able to speak on this a little bit better because I practiced in front of a group talking about podcasting. It made me create uh, you know, talks about podcasting, which actually I end up doing now every single year at FinCon. I get to do a workshop. This year was uh, Mind Map Your Podcast Launch, and it went from everything about how do you pick the name of your show to now we submit our RSS feed to Apple and a little bit beyond that. All those, you know, a lot of those slides are very similar to the ones I created when I did these little small meetup group sessions. I have to say you're very well spoken. I don't think you've said a single um this entire really so far. Well, you'll hear it when you go back and edit this. <laughs> do you think editing podcasts has played into like being conscious of how you uh like verbally present yourself because oh, yeah. you you are very well spoken and very relaxed and and I almost feel I almost feel as if a lot of that comes from just hours and hours and hours of of editing and like picking up on all those vocal tics and just just, no, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> I, I recognize I recognize verbal tics after editing someone for maybe five or ten minutes. 
But then I also know what I have. And a lot of times I start my sentences with the word so. I haven't so, even noticed it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, if I was interviewing you, I, the first word out of my mouth would be so. So, next question. So, this <laughs> so. It'd be horrible. There, there are a couple things as we were talking here that I just, I could hear myself going back around in a circle. And the listeners might even notice that. that Oh, he said that. He said it again. Talk about service. He's serving, serving, serving. You know, so could you edit some of that out and make it less uh, annoying? Sure. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, note by editing up people and hearing all these different ways that people speak, and we might classify them as crutches, and it's just the, the way people speak. Ums, obviously, is not a crutch. It's more like just crap. We got to cut it out. But, <laughs> <laughs> but you get the one who starts every sentence with, that's a great question. They're just formulating their question, and they're not ready to give up the mic yet. They want to hold on to the mic as, okay, I'm formulating my answer by saying, that's a great question. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I've got verbal tics. I just try not to use them. What do you prefer hosts do uh, instead of <laughs> using uh or that's a great question? Do you prefer silence or what do you, what do you think is the best way to begin to correct that? Hmm. That's a great question. (laughs) No, it's actually very interesting. Thinking about it, I don't want to, I struggle with this too when I hear one of my clients, I'm like, I could coach them through that, but how do you approach it? Saying, stop saying um all the time. (laughs) You can't, or and um, or yeah. Well, I've also noticed something too. If you bring it to like top of mind awareness, people almost seem to do it more. So yeah, or... Or you're talking about it, and then they, they're five minutes in, they realize they're doing it, and they go, okay, hold on. And then their entire demeanor on the microphone stops. Uh, and I do not want that to happen. I don't know how to, to coach people through changing, and then they realize, oh, I've, I've been doing my old habit again without making it, you know, they're, they're getting excited about their topic. They're talking, 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 but like, but like, but like, and then they realize, <laughs> oh, I'm saying but like again too much. Hold on. And then they stop, and they start over again. Okay, well, we were just talking about, and it's, you've just taken the speed down to 10 miles an hour instead of <laughs> the 70 they're running at. Right. And that's not good for the listener. So I, you asked a question similar to how to, how would I want a podcast host to, I, I can't advise that now. I don't know how I'm not a, a speech, like a vocal speech coach, specialist, right? vocal coach. Thank you. See, I don't even know the words. I wouldn't know how to do it. Maybe somebody in the listening audience can go to your show notes page and leave a comment. Let us know <laughs> some tips and tricks on what they can do to coach your clients to stop, you know, using crutches and of course not interrupt the flow as they realize, oh, I'm doing it again. That would be amazing. Imagine, just imagine if everyone could be coached and, and correct all the ums and ahs. Well, let's let's take a sharp left turn. When is it not appropriate to edit a show like doing detailed edits because not every show really needs someone to comb through 70 80 percent of of the filler content but where do we draw the line i point back to what we were talking about earlier about friction we're getting rid of friction now if somebody has notoriety if they've got if they're you know seen in the public if they're celebrity something like that i mean you can't edit bob newhart for people who don't know who Bob Newhart is, he has a very unusual, not an unusual, but he's a very different way of speaking that is humor. And if you take away his stammers, he's no longer the funny Bob Newhart we all know and love as Papa Elf, uh, you know, in the movie Elf. Oh. Yeah, you remember the guy who was the dad yeah. of, of Will Ferrell and Elf? That's Bob Newhart. And if you take away his, well, you know, it, uh, it, you know his stammers, <laughs> he's no longer Bob Newhart. And that just takes away from his magic of being a comedic actor. You take away his personality. So there are going to be times where you just got to leave stuff in. Now, I, I think there's times when you can still fix some of it and it still leaves them as, as that person that they, their, their character still comes through. And that's what I'm trying to do is just trying to find that happy medium. Let's get to the point. Let's get to it faster. Get rid of the, the intrusions, the obstructions, the bumps, but without taking away the personality that's behind that voice. Let's talk about video in podcasting then, because I know here at uh, Cast, we're one of the one of the leading networks in multi-channel podcasting. So we have a lot of clients that will film 
their shows and have even built out these crazy sets specifically for their podcast. And something I've been struggling with personally as a producer for a few of these shows is where do I draw the line between just doing a video edit essentially versus a detailed audio edit? Because when you're editing video, you can't really cut every um and ah. I mean, you can and you can mask it with different camera angles, but that's just way too time consuming. I mean, there's situations where it it can be worth it, but when we're talking about efficiency, it simply doesn't make sense. But in your opinion, let's say we've got like an Instagram influencer that has their own podcast and they're filming it and you're editing it with a multi-camera sequence in Premiere. So you've just got like three camera angles and you're switching the camera angles. And what do you do with that audio? Because of course you're going to mix it down as per usual like you would an audio edit. But once you sync that to the video and edit the video, would you then take that audio and then edit it like a normal audio episode? Or would you just rip it then the audio version of the podcast is just literally the audio ripped from the video. What would you do in that situation? Well, the answer to your question is the number one answer to all questions in podcasting, which is it depends. <laughs> it does. If you've got a performance, a live performance, you're not really going to edit that much. You wouldn't have to. Like if you saw, I, I, I don't know, I have Steve Ray Vaughn in my head for some reason. Um, you know, Steve Ray Vaughn on stage live you're not editing that. You're just recording and capturing the moment if in, in video or audio, all that stuff. But then if you are trying to produce something more like a movie, well, of course you're going to have different camera angles and you're, you're trying to pose everything in the best light possible, literally and figuratively. So do you take the audio from that to make your podcast or do you use the raw? I, I, it, it depends on what you're trying to accomplish with your show. Uh, I have some clients that will take their audio and then they'll take bits and pieces of it and use it for promotional purposes. But they're pretty much it's long form audio. And then they might use some video components to do something special. And it's not the full 60 minute interview. It's, you know, five minutes or something like that. You could look at it this way. The ROI on podcasting, in my opinion, when you got a listener who's listening to you for a while, the ROI on a listener is 10 times that of a person who reads a blog. Hmm. And a blog is easier to write than, than do a podcast. Just, it is. At least, you know, it's less time consuming. It might be a little more, I, I hate blogging. I hate writing. So I, maybe I'm just saying it because. <laughs> <You're biased. laughs> yeah. I mean, I love blogging, but I just, I hate writing. Oh. But it's easier to write, I think, than to do a podcast. Podcast more difficult. Some people can just run off the mouth and that's fine. Uh, but then you've got to do all the post-production and planning for it as well. But then you think about video, we're 10xing the complexity again. Right. Because now we have the lighting and we got to make sure the audio is captured without having a mic right in front of our face. Unless that's, you know, the Joe Rogan experience, you got to have that mic right in front of you. And and if you do any cuts, well, now you've, you there's there's very hard, it's very difficult to make the video match exactly because you might have moved over a centimeter. And if you're cutting something out, you're going to notice that. Of course, a lot of people like that now in the videos you see. It's the camera's bouncing all over. If we're from one sentence to the next with no break. It's crazy, like on YouTube. That ROI might be there. And it's because you are now not just grabbing the attention of somebody who's reading your blog for a couple of seconds or listening to your podcast for a half hour to an hour, but now you've got them watching your video. They can see your body language. If the ROI is there, then go with video. Uh, and and you, if then we got to think about repurposing the audio or just taking the original audio. How do you want to use that? It, it's really case by case. I can't answer that question. I don't deal with video at all. So maybe you want to cut out this whole last five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think I'll keep it in. I, I think I'll, okay. I'll even say perhaps consider it. Like even if you need to to hire out somebody to help with that, because out here we're seeing a lot of uh, a lot of video podcasts picking up, and it's going to be interesting to see how it shapes the future of podcasting because more and more people are listening on YouTube and it's Isn't that crazy strange <laughs> we're using all this bandwidth for video and we we're just listening to it in our earbuds <laughs> yeah. well not not exactly yeah. a lot of people even with like Joe Rogan like they'll 
they'll either have it like running in a different tab or it'll be up on a TV in their house or something. Like people aren't actively watching it, but a lot of people are technically watching it on YouTube. And another thing I think is interesting is how quickly Spotify is catching up to Apple Podcasts. And I'm really curious as to why you think that is and what do you think that will do for the industry? My opinion on Spotify versus Apple? Yeah. Okay. Not video. We're not talking about video anymore. Well, we can we can throw YouTube. <laughs> well, Spotify, I don't think does any video, do they? No. So we got to go back to just Apple versus Spotify. It is interesting. And I've always wanted to have a second player in the space for podcasting. Uh, the most recent stats I've heard from Libsyn on their customers is uh, Spotify is about 12%, whereas uh, the Apple Podcast app is at least 50 Actually, I think it's a lot more than that, but I can't remember the numbers exactly. I like that there's another player, and I think Spotify definitely appeals to two distinct type of listeners. One is the new ones who are coming on board, because honestly, I don't even like the Apple Podcast app. I try to use it only because I still sync to iTunes on my desktop, because I have an old iPod that I use when I mow the lawn, walk the dog, just easy to clip on and go, uh, rather than lugging around the old, you know, the big old iPhone. So Spotify is capturing the new people because it's a decent app. Uh, they're already listening to things on Spotify. They've already know how to use it. It's already syncing to their car or to whatever Bluetooth speakers have got in their house. And the other one is a lot of entertainment. I believe a lot of people listen to entertainment type or personality type podcasts on Spotify. Not necessarily the technical stuff, not necessarily the, uh, you know, even a lot of the, the, the clients that I have. Spotify is not a big player for them because you can get into some shows. We're talking about, you know, personal finance, investing in real estate. And it's not as much a casual, you know, sitting there casually listening to it. You really kind of have to pay attention to it and to get the most out of it. Whereas on Spotify, if you're listening to a personality, uh, celebrity, entertainment, you're kind of listening, but you're able to also then focus on other things a little bit more. You're spot on with that too, because like with a lot of the influencer shows out here, Spotify is doing upwards to 35% uh, of total wow, listening. That's awesome. And a lot of that comes from these influencers telling their younger audiences like, hey, find us on Spotify. Like they start with Spotify, yeah. iTunes, mm -hmm. and so on. And I, I think it's cool. I think it's cool. And from an advertising perspective, I'm curious to see what that does for the monetization of the, like the everyday podcaster running just dynamic ad insertions like Spotify right. does for music, but for podcasts. And I, I'm super excited to see what that has in store. But I know you're a busy guy and I'll let you go. But before I do, where can people find you online? Everything they want, they can find at stevestewart.me. That's Steve, S-T-E-W-A-R-T dot M-E. I can't get the dot com. He's owned it for 21 years. Oh. That other Steve Stewart guy. Oh. So I had to get the dot me. Uh, or if they want to find out more about podcast editing and get into a community, go to podcasteditors.club. And yes, I grabbed the dot club domain. Nice. <laughs> podcasteditors.club. That'll send them right to the Facebook group. Of course, of course, they can just you know search inside of Facebook for podcast editors. I'm the only one that's got a substantial uh, group there. And uh, we'll, we'll definitely be talking more about the conference in that group as time proceeds. So just stevestewart.me for me or podcasteditors.club for the Facebook group. Awesome. Thank you, much. Ah, another edit. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much, Steve. Hey, thanks, Bradley. I had a great time. Uh, Is I it Brad or Bradley? It says Brad uh, down here on my screen, but you're Bradley. That's the debate of the century. I, honestly, I have no preference, but I don't know. I should have said Brad. It's down here. It's written <laughs> for me.